further ado, I would like to introduce the amazing Joey Hess. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, if anybody can't read this, you probably want to move toward the front. I have a lot of um, code examples in this talk that you're going to want to be able to read or you probably won't understand anything. You might not anyway because they're all going to be in Haskell. <laughs> so you may also want to leave through the rear entrance there. So, <laughs> hi, I'm going to be talking about uh, type-driven configuration management with Propeller. Okay, so. What are the best practices for system configuration these days? And if you think about what config files should look like, they should be in some kind of simple file format, right? Like an INI file or something like that. Some kind of declarative format. System D switch to declarative format for all kinds of init scripts and stuff, and people generally think that's a good idea. And we configure systems often by composing different pieces together into one unified thing. So we install a bunch of different packages or we take a bunch of Git repositories or whatever and we get a unified thing. So these are three points to keep in mind during the talk. Okay, so here's two configuration management systems that are in common use and that I really know nothing at all about. Um, so Ansible and Puppet here, um, they both use a simple-ish config file format and then they extend it with a few things. So you start with an INI file and you add variables and you add some kind of a hash to it so that you can, uh, let's see, yes, yeah, right here. So you have this uh, extra information that doesn't fit in the format. And uh, with Ansible, they even add loops to it and they get this complicated looking thing over here. So uh, this seems to work okay for people. And Puppet also has a separate language for conditionals and loops. Now, um, it turns out that the Ansible config file format is Turing complete, pretty obviously. Um, the Puppet language is actually designed, I think it's designed not to be Turing complete, although I found a gist on GitHub that says this shows that it's Turing complete, so don't quote me on that. Um, but let's think for a minute about Turing complete config files, okay? It's generally thought not to be a good idea. There's this Turing tar pit concept where uh, everything is possible but nothing of interest is easy, right? And, you know, SendMail CF and stuff like that taught us that we don't want Turing complete config files. If you can write the towers of Hanoi in your config file, you're doing something wrong, right? And, of course, they're also not declarative. And I just said that declarative files are one of the best practices currently. However, if you have a Turing complete language, you also get a few things that are kind of handy. You can make embedded domain-specific languages inside the config file to configure different parts of your system in ways that limit the possibilities in useful ways. And you have a type checker if you're using a modern language like Rust or Haskell, you have a type checker so you can avoid bad configurations using the type checker. And that's really what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So Propeller is the system that I wrote that's kind of similar to Ansible or Puppet, it's a configuration management system. It goes out to hosts and it does stuff to them until they look the way you want, right? It deploys properties to hosts. And this is a lot of Haskell code, but don't worry, there'll be a whole lot more later. Um, yeah, and, but also don't panic, okay? The Haskell code here is not here that you have to understand every line. It's just here for, to give me something to talk about. And uh, the important parts will be, will be pulled out. So if we look at this file, let's, the first part, it's, well, this is a Haskell program. It starts with a main function, kind of like C does, but ignore that bit. In, in the second part here, we have a list of hosts, and that's very simple. It's foo and bar, two hosts. Okay, down here we have foo, which is a host. And so it has a host name, and it has some properties. Um, so there are three properties. It has the Debian OS running uh, Debian stable on AMD64. It has some kind of standard looking sources list file for that operating system, and it has OpenSSH installed, so it's a very basic server. And yeah, if you want to ask questions during, go ahead. Mad Duck, do you have one? Because this is kind of tricky stuff, so if something is, if you're getting confused, please let me know. Not necessarily confused, but interested in your answer. Stable, Jesse, to me, is uh, 
okay. duplicate information? Yeah. Uh, well, it is duplicate information. However, Propeller is included in Debian. It is kind of hard to change it after Debian has frozen and begun making a release and and make it be Debian 7.0 when I don't know what the version number is. You're, you're familiar with this problem, and if you're not, go talk to the DI team or something. Okay? So the thing that I really want you to notice on this slide is these two, well, these three instances of double colons. And this is a little piece of Haskell syntax. There's going to be a couple of them during the talk that it will help you to understand, but it's not really mandatory. Um, so the first one here says that the hosts value has type list of host. Okay? Kind of simple. The second one just says foo has type host, or foo is a host if you prefer to say it that way. So double colons means that is the type of this thing in Haskell. And the, the thing on the left is the function name or the value name, and the thing on the right is the type. Okay, so I showed you a host, and that's one of the main types in Propeller, but the other one is property. And this is where it starts to actually configure the system. So a property is it's a basic building block of Propeller. It's anything that you can say about a system. You could say a system runs Debian stable. That's a property. You could say a system is an SSH server. It has apt installed. That's a property. So I've given two um, OS Debian and app.installed or things that are shipped with Propeller. And then the two... Uh, this here and this here are two functions that I've defined, say, in my propeller config file. Um, so this is a function that takes a Debian suite here. OS Debian take is a, has type Debian suite to architecture to property. So this means it's a function with two parameters, a Debian suite and an architecture, and it creates a property. And this is kind of hard syntax to get used to if you're not used to Haskell. But I won't really have it. I won't have too many examples of it. So don't really worry if it's looking a little annoying to keep track of whether what the arrow is doing there. But um, the important thing to, note, to see here is that you can take a, um, a less specific property func creating, creating, creation function and create a property out of it just by applying the parameters that it needs. Okay? Make sense to everybody? Okay. So, whoa, where did that come from? Okay. Um, so, of course, Propeller, being a Haskell program, uses a lot of other data types. And it kind of has a data type for everything that you could think of, as, everything that you could think a system of having, it has a data type for it. So it has, like, a port data type, which just says, here's the port number of something, and that lets us distinguish it from some other value. And it has, oh, an x86, this here is a, um, x86 is a value of type architecture. So... There's other values of that type, obviously. There's a whole lot of them. And um, down here, SSH, EDCSA is a SSH key type. So you have different kinds of SSH keys, and this tells you what kind it is. Now, there's a lot of reasons that we use a lot of different data types like this. But a nice one is that if you have a typo like SSH, EDCSA, the compiler can tell you, which is kind of handy if you're editing your propeller config file at 3 AM or something, and you make a typo. Or if you have a head cold like I do now, I apologize for my hoarse voice. And, uh, and you're trying to go configure your system, it's kind of handy to have the type checker. Just checking simple things like this can save you a lot of problems. Okay. So that's the first reason we use types. But what's the real reason? Let's step back and, and the thing that gets Haskell programmers all excited is that types let you prove things about a program. And in fact, there's something called the Curry-Howard isomorphism, or the Curry-Howard correspondence, that says that a compiled program that uses types is a proof about, um, of what those types express. So if I have a program that, say, adds two numbers together, adds two integers, and produces an integer, then that is a proof that you can add two integers together. Okay, whatever. But uh, we can use this for many more complicated proofs. And of course, it's kind of nice to be able to prove things about your systems that you're deploying using configuration management. And that's really what Propeller wants to do. It wants to avoid problems before you start pushing changes out to systems, even to test systems. So you can say, OK, I've solved this whole class of problems. I have a proof that this will not occur. And then you just don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's great, right? So I have the, I've talked about the property type. Now, we often 
compose things together. I talked about that in the beginning. Composing things together is one of the ways that we build up systems, right? So we can compose properties together. And here's uh, four different ways that Propeller lets you compose properties together. And they're all functions, they all have the type of, it takes two properties and it creates a third property. So for example, down here, we have this secure foo property and it starts by, install. it has apt installed foo, so the foo package is installed. It's composed with the property that the etsy foo file is set in the secure mode. So this requires, makes this property actually happen before this one. This one depends on this one. So, and then it's composed with the on change property, which actually looks and says, well, did these ones, when they're combined into one property, did that property, when it went off to the machine and checked if that property was satisfied, did it have to do something? Did it install the package? Did it modify the file? Did it do both? If so, we'll restart the daemon. So you can compose properties together and get another property and build up more complicated things out of smaller building blocks, okay? Now, this is great. Whoa, I think I missed something. Nope, oh, okay, yeah, I was, I had a little piece of syntax which, if you're a little bit confused about why I'm like doing shell quoting now, <laughs> um, that's actually a way to, it's just a little piece of Haskell syntax. If you have a function that takes two parameters, you could put them over here on the right of the function like you normally do, or you could put one on each side of the function. And it just kind of makes, it avoids having to parenthesize things a lot, so I use it a lot in Propeller. But if that seems complicated, just ignore it, please. Think about the types and not about the implementations of this talk, that's the important thing. So I was saying you could compose things together, but if you're composing together two properties and getting a property with some function, and another one is using two properties to get a property, well, okay, how are these two things different? You can't tell. So we talked about, I talked about the Turing tar pit. This is kind of a compositional desert where everything looks the same. You're just wandering around. You've composed all the grains of sand that you want together, but they all look the same, and so you haven't really accomplished much, right? So you've got all this wonderful type safety, and now you've thrown it all away on, to get compositionality. So that's a problem. The types aren't really proving anything. And I have a theory, which I haven't learned enough about container orchestration to verify, the, their um, if you have Docker, say, and you're composing all these Docker containers together, then you've probably entered some kind of compositional desert where you need something higher level to look at it and say, does it make sense that all these things are together here on this machine and here on this machine, and put it all together and make it, you know, arrange things to make sense. So I think that they're dealing with the same issue, but I don't really do that kind of thing, so it's a theory. Um, okay, so we'd like to avoid that compositional desert. And the way that I want to do it is make bad combinations of properties be a type error. Okay, and here faults in 42 is a type error. A type error is a good thing. A type error isn't something that you don't want to see. A type error means I have prevented you from shooting yourself in the foot. And when shooting yourself in the foot means that your mail server doesn't work at 3 a.m., that is a good thing. Okay? So, one way to do this is if we're composing two properties together, they just look the same. So let's make things that are similar properties but have different types. And then we can change how they compose together. So the first, and I'm kind of going to go through now, and it, this is why I want you to ask questions during, because there's a, quite a few of these things, and they each are a thing that I added propeller, kind of in the order I added them, so they don't really build on each other. Um, revertible property is just a property that you can revert. So it has two actions. This property bar installs bar normally, but if you reverted it somehow, it would remove bar. So it's a property that can be undone, okay? And down here in this example, the foo host has the bar property, but if you decide you don't want bar on there anymore, you just revert it by changing that to a bang, and now you've uh, removed bar from the host. Now, what if you change something else there to a bang? Well. If you try to revert the fact that it's running Debian, that isn't gonna work. And the type checker can tell you it won't work because OS Debian is not a revertible property, right? So that's nice, but how about if you compose revertible properties with, say, properties? Well, again, if I have a web server property that is the web, serv web server docked, which is revertible, and it uses Docker to dock the web server, which is revertible, um, and, and it requires web content, which isn't a revertible property, it's just a property, 
then the type checker can tell you that, well, you said it was a revertible property, but web content isn't revertible, so this isn't a revertible property. And you could actually then go change this to just be regular property, and they actually compose that way, and you end up with a property, even though you have a revertible property and a property, you get a property. Okay, that was complicated. <laughs> um, now, I maybe, I, yeah, I'll go ahead and talk about this. Um, when you revert a revertible property, the, uh, and you've, com you've composed two of them together with requires or something, everything runs backwards. So here we have web server docked, which docks a web server, and then it undocks it when reverted. We have web content, which makes the index.html file contain something, and when it's reverted, it removes it. And if we revert the composition of those two, it first removes the index.html file, and then it undocks the web server. Or no? Does that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Hmm. Anyway, maybe I shouldn't even mention it. Okay. Um, revertible property isn't perfect, because we're kind of just saying, well, here's how to revert it, it'll work, I promise. Type checker, it's good. And so if you have this web content thing, when it's reverted, it deletes the index.html file, but maybe the file was there when, before, so you're not reverting the actual state. Maybe you should empty it. Maybe you should make it not be readable. I don't know. The web server docked when using Docker is probably a good revertible property because once you've undocked something from a Docker system, the only difference from previous, from before you put that container in there is maybe some caching or something. Okay. So, whoa. So, um, my point with that is that uh, properties just model the system. You're not pinning down every detail about the system with types, right? You can't. But, it, but even pinning down a small amount lets the type checker help you out. Okay, so pro uh, Propeller happens to support four different containers. Um, and it actually supports them all in a very similar way. You can create images of any of these types using it, and uh, I'll show you how to do it for, uh, I think, systemd containers or systemd machines. So, um, okay, so this is a systemd container type, which is a new type, and it looks kind of just like the host examples I gave you. It's a bunch of properties hooked together, and uh, and it has the name web server because systemd machines have to have a name. And then down here on host foo, we've uh, told systemd to end spawn the web server. And so just like that, you've got another container running in your host. Propeller will go off and build it. And then if you later, you've done that and you go edit your config file, and we have two questions, Karen, oh, back there. Um, but anyway, I was gonna say, if you do that and you then edit your config file, it won't rebuild everything. It'll just go, it'll reach inside that container and make the change inside. And it can do that for any of these four things that I listed, which is kind of handy. Um, okay. Sorry, question. Um, you've, a couple times I've, now, you've, I've seen your uh, declarative, the example on the slide being systemd.end spawned, past tense. How yeah. come you've chosen that naming convention? Uh, I mean, Edward's right. work is, you know, goes off into funny tenses just to pick unique names. But, yeah. like, is it implying that after the fact, the state will be that this has happened? Is that what you're I, aiming for? I think he, the way I look at it is it has the property system D has end spawned it. I don't know. I, that's just the tense I picked, and it seemed to work, honestly. Yeah. Um, on the container implementations, in FreeBSD, what are you using? Is it plain trails, or is it IO cage, or? Oh, um, Propeller just uses the regular OS's container system. It doesn't implement its own at all. So when it uses Docker, it just tells Docker, hey, go run this image, go pull it down in the normal way. Okay, if it has, so if okay. it has to, it'll reach inside the image and change it more because you might just say, start with plain Debian. I trust that one. It doesn't have any weird files in it. Debian provided it. And then throw Apache on it. Maybe that's easier than using some pre-provided thing that does something weird. But um, yeah, it just uses the regular stuff in the system. Propeller doesn't have any, it's, it just runs a bunch of shell code in the end, right? It's not, <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, so this web server um, container here is another way to compose properties, right? So we have three properties and they're all composed into a systemd container, MadDuck. Sorry, another question. No, it's fine. Um, you said the, earlier on, before the other questions were, you said they, that um, you reach into the containers. Mm -hmm. um, now, a systemd container might just be a machine, right? 
Um, does that mean that your client, or how, how, do, how does transport work, and does that mean that your client is actually being talked to, or do you somehow have an, a sure. parent? Okay, well, I haven't talked about how Propeller actually works, and really, for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't matter. Um, but the way it does it is it's actually running on the host, and it actually dives in wearing a suit of um, LDD preloaded libraries and runs. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that I added Propeller fairly early on was DNS configuration because I hate editing bind zone files by hand. And I figured, well, if I make uh, the IP address of a host just be another property, here's the IPv4 of that host, and the alias, or C name of the host, I called it alias because C name's kind of a weird name. Um, well, if those are properties, then maybe this property down here of the DNS server can look at the list of hosts, which up here, hosts is web and DNS, so it knows about this host and this host. So it can look at that, it can say, okay, this property's there, this property's there, this property's there. I'm running, for example, <laughs> .com, I know some garbage, I don't know what all that is, and then I'll make a bind config file. So this is kind of handy because you don't have to edit bind configs, but uh, how does it actually work? Because we've had properties and they've been combined together in a host, but now we need some way to look inside the host and say, this host has this IP address. And we saw a lot of these things actually. Propeller says that the host has um, that OS Debian stable, and then it says go configure the app sources list for that. And it doesn't say using Debian stable, just go configure it. And there have been several other examples of using it. And so each of these is a property, but all it really does is it adds some kind of info to the host, right? And we can introspect on the info. But what's the type of the info? This is Haskell. You can't just say, oh, the info is an IP4 address, or maybe it's an alias, or, I mean, you could, but it would be a big data type that would combine all these things together into a single data type, and that would be a mess. So this was a problem for a while, but I eventually came up with a solution that I think I'm gonna gloss over just on the interest of time. Um, it turns out that you can do something pretty close to dynamic typing in Haskell and actually have a is info type class and uh, be able to shove different values in and pull different values back out. And you're basically doing dynamic programming now, but you still have maintained type safety and I'm not gonna go into details. But once I had info and it actually worked, I had a problem, which is that if a container has a, some info and it's put into a host, how do I make sure that that info in the container is visible when you look at the host? It's like you have to propagate the info up out of the container into the host and then the DNS server can look at it or whatever. Maybe you have a container that says, my C name is foo.example.com and when you've docked that container into a host, you want that host to have a C name when the DNS server looks at it. So this was a big problem, and I can't really go into the details because I'm not gonna be talking about monads at all in this talk. Um, but the solution is where things really start to get interesting. Um, I had to change the property type entirely. Before we've just had properties, okay? But now we have two different types of properties. One of them is property has info, and this is all one data type, okay? And another one is property no info. Again, all one data type. These are two completely distinct data types. They're as different as uh, bool and string. Okay. Whoa. Let's not go there yet. Okay, so once I did that, I started realizing that I could do even more fun things with types. So that was kind of a gateway drug to really getting into the fun stuff. So but it took a little push, which was that somebody started using Propeller with FreeBSD. And I had only supported running Propeller on Debian, maybe it would work on Ubuntu if you were lucky, but I wasn't gonna support it. But some guy went and ported it to FreeBSD and sent me some files with like FreeBSD jails and ways to use the FreeBSD package manager and all this stuff. So now I had properties, well property no info or property has info now, but they were for FreeBSD and then I had ones for Debian. Now this is a problem if you're trying to compose, compose together two different properties for two OSs, so I didn't like that idea at all. So the solution to that was again to refine the property type. 
So now we have property Debian-like, property FreeBSD, property Unix-like, and we can even do crazy things like this, which means this property is a Debian-like property and a FreeBSD property at the same time. And this isn't like adding two numbers together. This is like adding two types together, okay? This is like saying this type has a type which is the sum at the type level of other types. So this is kind of high level type stuff. Um, and also the, we had, I got rid of, I was able to get rid of no info because if it doesn't say has info, it has no info. So that was handy. It made things shorter too. And once I had this, and like I said, that's types, type level lists, you're adding them together. Once I had that, I could easily let the type checker tell me if I accidentally use the FreeBSD package manager on my Debian host, which is a good thing, right? Although probably not a mistake you make too often, but if you're writing a bunch of properties and deep within one you use another one and it turns out that it doesn't support exactly the set of OSs that you said you would support, then the type checker will tell you and that's where it gets really useful when you're actually developing. We got one question back here, Karen. Three rows back. So, I think the way some other configuration management system handle that is that they actually abstract what package man management tool you're going yeah, to use at sure. all. So what, what motivates the choice of using that? Give than, me a minute. Uh, Give me a minute and I will answer that question. Thank okay. You. So, we could compose supported operating systems. So if we have a property that is Debian-like and a property that is a FreeBSD property, and they both upgrade the system, well, we'd like to get this property, right? We'd like to abstract it into a higher level property that just upgrades the system and it figures out which to run. And this is the way to do it. This is another thing that takes a property, except it's a property something, right? And it takes another property something. The two somethings are not different. So a property A and a property B, and it gives you a property A plus B, okay? And this pick OS thing was like one line of code. So, so we can abstract. I don't normally do a whole lot of abstraction in Propeller by default because I don't want to like, um, abstraction has its own costs, right? And I normally am not administering FreeBSD hosts, so I don't want to worry about abstraction. Okay, but there's a little problem with um, this type level OS thing, which is that say I'm making a property and I call it FiskFix. So it's gonna make the etsy default RCS file contain this thing that makes the system not hang on boot when it has no console. And I just tell, okay, I could do that, that's easy. However, the type checker then comes back and says, well, contains lines is actually a Unix-like property, it'll run on any Unix-like system, but you've told me that this is a Debian-like property, which it actually is because only Debian has this as far as I know. So how do you solve this? Well, you have to add one little function here which tightens the target of the property. So it tightens it from Unix-like to Debian-like. And what's the type of this thing? Well, I can't tell you because it wouldn't fit on the slide. Okay, but it exists, so that's nice. Now, this is where it gets really fun and also we've now gotten into branches of Propeller that haven't been merged yet, but I think Mad Duck has a question first. Uh, uh, why isn't a Debian-like system Unix-like? Isn't there an inheritance or, oh, I mean, you're, um, you're adding these things together, but they're yeah, not, right. it's not multiple inheritance, but it's more like a struct or. Yeah. Um, so a property is either Debian-like or Unix-like. A Debian -like, uh, Unix-like property can be added to a, de to a host with a bunch of other Debian-like properties and they'll all combine together okay. That might be what, what's confusing you. I didn't show an example of, say, a host that has, I don't know, a, a file created and that's obviously a Unix-like property and then apt installed a package and that's a Debian-like property. If the host has both of those properties, the type checker will still be able to figure out that that's okay. The way, it, the way it's implemented. So I didn't have to worry about inheritance. Maybe it would be nice to have inheritance, but I think that inheritance is at the type level would be a lot of implementation nonsense, so I'd rather not go there. Um, I, it already took, just to get this, um, this plus and this type level list stuff is like 200 lines of type level Haskell code. 
So including like an implementation of lists and singletons and all the fun stuff that you need to build up to that point using Debian Stables version of GHC, which please upgrade it because it's ancient and horrible. Um, <laughs> with the new version, it would be like two lines of code. Anyway, um, okay. Oh, I was gonna talk about this. So type level port conflict detection. This is um, kind of my holy grail, which I've almost, I've got implemented, but I haven't got merged yet. So I often run a lot of Tor bridges just because I have, if I have an IP address, with some bandwidth and port 80 isn't being, or port, for, port 443 isn't being used, well, why not let the Tor project do something with it, as long as I don't care if China blocks it. And you all should run Tor bridges too, but uh, the problem with that is, uh, say you've put some Tor bridges on hosts and then you decide, well, I need another web server, so you go through a web server property on a host, and suddenly you've got a problem that Propeller fails at runtime, which you don't want Propeller failing at runtime, that's no fun, right? I mean, you've probably just pushed this to your Git config and then the hosts have pulled it down, which is how it normally runs in my setup, and you learn about it later, and that's not good. So it'd be great to detect this kind of thing at compile time when Propeller is compiling your config.hs. So the way that I've done this is I've added another um, type to the list of types that a property can have. So it can use a port. You can use port 80 and port 443, and this one uses port 443. And so if I try to combine these two together, um, the type checker is, I'm basically programming the, the type checker at this point to say, oh, if two things use the same port, they can't be combined. If two things use the same OS, they can be combined, okay? So there's a, there's a level of type level programming, which is kind of, you're telling the type checker exactly what these types mean. And this works, it's implemented. The only problem is that now I've got like this using port 80, what if the web server runs on port 8081? I have to keep it in sync with the configuration. So I have a type and I have a configuration, I have to be kept in sync. Or maybe the configuration should look at the type of the property that's inside and figure out what port to use. And yeah, I can actually do that, but it's a little challenging. And maybe it's not right to embed this and at the type level. I should mention this 80 here isn't the value 80. It's not some byte living in memory that has the value 80, right? This is actually the type 80. The type 80 has the value of whatever they pick for the type 80. I don't know, it's definitely not the number 80, okay? And uh, so that's kind of cool. It's actually probably like the uh, piano number for 80, so a bunch of uh, ones and then an end of ones or something. Uh, so it's kind of handy that Haskell supports this crazy stuff. And oh yeah, the other problem is that if you're using Apache, you can have virtual hosts. And so then you could have two properties, each with a virtual host using Apache. And then the type checker has to somehow know this is a virtual host, so I can combine them together even though they're both using port 80. And that seems like it gets really hairy and I haven't implemented that. So, to sum up a little bit, I started off with just a few simple custom Haskell data types. Properties, hosts, ports, that kind of thing. And that kind of probably got me 50% or maybe, I don't know, 80% of the pie. This is completely made up numbers, but because uh, how, how do you detect how many type errors you've created? I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I added revertible properties and that was really useful. It let me build up a lot of properties by composing together revertible properties and not miss that I had accidentally slipped in a non-revertible property and that kind of thing. And I solved this info propagation problem that I glossed over, but it would have been horrible if I hadn't solved it because your DNS server could have, could have lost the C name of your host or something, and that wouldn't be a good thing. So it was great that I was able to solve that using types. And I added supported OSs here and port conflict detections coming. And so I've kind of grown and grown the number of things that Repeller prevents at the type level at compile time. And so I think this is a big win. Uh, for using more and more complicated data types. And it hasn't really impacted the program really significantly at the user level. Maybe a little bit, but it seems like a win to me. So um, I'll take any more questions if people have anything about what I've talked about so far. And then I have a few bonus slides that I can talk about even more fun things. Cool. Um, it, uh, it occurs to me if you've got a type system and some of these properties 
that you can start making assertions about the environment that you want to have. So, for instance, you could say, I don't want anything in my DMZ allowing non-standard ports. Yeah. Or yeah, you, like you could. That. Of course, you'd have to then express that at the type level if you want the type checker to check it. So you may have to do some type level programming or something to do it, or maybe you'd have to have a, a way to build up the type that expresses what you want. But yeah, I think that kind of thing is, is definitely within the realm of possibility. Okay, people want to see the bonus slides, I think. So um, this is the first one. It's, it's a simple bonus slide. Getting, oh, we have one more question. Go ahead. Um, so one of the reasons uh, I know a few people have moved from Puppet to Ansible, for example, mm. is the Puppet is more property-based like this. You can describe mm. a system where Ansible gives you steps for upgrade. Is, I mean, in okay. a property-based system, do you have an upgrade? Yeah, so Propeller always has an, well, <laughs> it's hard to say always because we're dealing with a complicated Unix system and we've abstracted out in a very few, we've distracted out in a very few um, details, right? But Propeller tries to have all its properties be idempotent and be able to recover from whatever state the system's in and that kind of thing. So if I have a Propeller property that says the system's running Debian stable Jesse and I change it to whatever it should upgrade, if I have a Propeller property saying, you know, Apache is installed with this configuration, I change the configuration, it'll go change it out. So it handles all that kind of thing, I think, but it may not do it as well as Ansible. I've never used Ansible, so I can't comment. So what I wanted to talk about here is, you know, Pascal's a functional programming language. I haven't really shown many functions. I had a few examples of ones that are in Propeller, but here's an actual function just to add that to the talk. Uh, so web is a function from basically, uh, from basically a byte to a host. And so down here we can use web with the values one to 10 and get 10 different hosts, okay? And each host has an IP address, which comes from showing the value that we passed in. And it has a host name that comes from showing the value. It says www.example.com, www.example.com, and so on. So this is a whole set of hosts created using a function. And so you can use this kind of thing with Propeller, probably a little bit more sophisticated because you want to have actual, uh, you know, like a load balancing or proper network set up, not just a round robin, which is what this creates, because they all have CNAME www.example.com. So if you, if you create the DNS for this using Propeller, you'll just get a CNAME. You get a, um, I'm sorry, you'll get a, uh, a round robin. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's easy to make functions that create hosts. It's easy to add higher level stuff on top of this that say goes off and uses some library to create Amazon virtual machines or whatever, spin them up and that kind of thing. I haven't really done it a lot, but it's all possible. So I wanted to point out that you can use functions to do interesting stuff like that once you get here. And the second thing is the really fun slide, which fits all on one slide, but the people in the back probably can't see, right? So. This is creating disk images with Propeller, a complete example of a disk image being created. So down here we have host bar, and it just has a few properties. It's running Debian unstable. It has a kernel installed, which I've left off of the other ones for space, but you really need a kernel if you're gonna boot a disk image. And it has a root password. Notice the password isn't specified. Propeller has a way to add private data without putting in your config.hs file. It's encrypted with GPG in it gets to pull it around in a secure way. But anyway, um, you know, you have to have a root password to have a disk image that works. So we take this host bar, and then we have a host foo up here. And the only property that I've shown, it probably has more, is that it builds this image, serve disk images bar disk dot image, right? And it does it using a host ch root of bar. So this is the bar down here being used up here. And all that this does is it makes a ch root with these properties in it. And then it creates a disk image. And so this list here, which I've formatted in a way that Haskell programmers are used to, but you may not be used to, it's just a list of three partitions. It's a little DSL. It's an, actually an EDSL inside Propeller's little DSL. So it says this is the XT2 partition for boot. It has the boot flag set. Here's the XT4 partition for root. 
and let's add five gigabytes of free space because this thing de defaults to just sizing it to more or less fit the files that are within it. And here's a swap partition that's 256 megs. And so you've just given it, you've just given it that little information and it can actually spit out a bootable disk image. So what, where I'd like to go from here and I haven't gotten around to is find a bunch of people with ARM boards or get a bunch of ARM boards and create functions that can create a bootable disk image for different ARM, for whatever ARM board you would like. And that way, if you want to deploy an ARM board with Propeller, you could make a disk image, put all, the, put all the properties that you want your ARM system to have here, create the disk image and then DD it onto whatever medium the ARM board has and then boot it up and it's running. And once it's running, when you want to upgrade it, well, you don't have to do this again unless you want to. You can just point Propeller at it and say, here's the system bar, go do your thing. So it's, it's kind of a way to install an ARM system completely from scratch under your complete control, which I think would be nice to have, but I haven't gotten around to, uh, to building any of, getting down to the details of how to boot any of these systems and stuff. So uh, yeah, I was glad this all fit on one slide. I have to admit though that host ch root isn't implemented yet. <laughs> but, but if we look at it, it has type host to ch root. So it can't be that hard. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's really it. Um, so if anybody has any more questions or would like to me to go into more detail or whatever, or maybe talk about how I actually implemented some of this at the type level, I'm a little under the weather and might not be able to, feel free. Okay. Thank you very much, Joey. Want to take it? Take them, okay. absolutely. All right, did you stop recording or are you? Okay. Um, so I don't know Haskell and yeah. the, the syntax scares me. <laughs> Not so much because I don't think I could learn it or have uh, syntax highlighting help me, etc. cetera. But uh, um, I'm, I feel like I'm gonna, it's, got, it's a steep learning curve. But I totally see the benefit of the strong typing. It reminds me a little bit of XML, which also tries to, you know, <laughs> define the DSL and then you mm. have to like work within those bounds. Mm. That gets me to BCFG2 which uses XML for configuration management and okay. I just wonder, have you thought, have you thought of uh, higher level approaches to this? Like drag and drop system <laughs> configuration that don't output <laughs> Haskell or something, right. you know? Um, I've actually seen some examples of uh, drag and drop systems for hooking different thing, differently typed things in Haskell together and creating functions, which seemed like it was actually kind of usable. Um, it was kind of aimed at kids learning programming and stuff like that. So yeah, I haven't thought about it myself. Um, as far as higher level stuff myself, I just generally, I don't write like OS Debian stable Jesse AMD 64 every time. That's just stable. So I make a function stable equals that and then I can just say it has a property stable or whatever. So it's easy to abstract out things like that and that kind of gets you to a little bit higher level of abstraction, just generally the abstraction that you want, not some really complicated one. Okay. I don't you think we have any Lego, other. Lego, you know, if it were drag and drop, you just build yeah. the system. Yeah, right? sure, but the Lego blocks have really weird edges which are like in <coughs> weird higher geometries that can't be explained to lay yeah. people. <laughs> Yeah, great. Um, when I, I've been following you for a bit and saw the development of Propeller, and when I saw the OS Debian thing, mm. uh, I assumed that it was installing Debian. And I'm just realizing now, oh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just realizing now that it's stating that thing already runs Debian. So it is, however it isn't, because of the last slide, whoa! <laughs> um, on the last slide, I actually showed creating a disk image and where did it go? Yeah. So down here when it's using OS Debian and it creates the disk image from the, uh, let me make that full size again. Um, when it creates it, when it creates a disk image here, it actually has to go run to bootstrap to create the disk image. So it does actually go deploy Debian in the CH root. 
Um, now, normally, if you're running Propeller, you probably started with some cloud VM and it's already got Debian or whatever installed. So you just tell Propeller this is what it has, and you know. So the OS Debian thing actually only sets the info that it has Debian. It doesn't actually change anything about the system except for what other properties might do. Oh, however, I have a really cute hack. Um, I should show you all. Um, this is Propeller's list of supported modules. I've, pro I've had like 20 or 30 people support patches or add patches to Propeller. Uh, for a Haskell program, that's pretty impressive. Uh, now, uh, hmm, I don't know where it is. Somewhere hidden in this long list of stuff is a property that can take a system that's running Red Hat and move everything out of the way and to bootstrap Debian while it's running and give you a Debian system with the properties that you told it to have. And that seems to work. When I've only used it once or twice when I needed it. There's something called Deb Takeover that's a package that does the same thing, so. Huh? For what, that thing? The question that was not Mike was, can we pay you money for that? For the, for the thing that switches system types? Well, there's already a Debian package for it, so I didn't really do anything new there, except for make, um, I mean, kind of propeller is kind of, I'm, I'm not reusing that Debian package. I'm not reusing VM to bootstrap for creating a, uh, dis, a bootable disk image, because propeller kind of, once you have the properties of a system, you can create all these things by just hooking them together again. And so, yeah, I mean, feel free to pay me money, but I don't think it's necessary. Debian already has it. Okay, um, thank you all for some good questions.